Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Suzanne Nobrega. I am the co-director and outreach director for the Center for the Promotion of Health in the New England Workplace. Uh, we are a NIOSH Center for Excellence for Total Worker Health. And this webinar is part of CPH News quarterly um, webinar series on trends in total worker health. And we're pleased to offer this webinar event today as part of a collaborative effort with another Total Worker Health Center, um, the Harvard Center for Work Health and Wellbeing. Okay, and now we'll begin the presentations. So today's presentations will explore the impacts of policy, both legal regulations and organizational policies on the safety, health, and well-being of healthcare workers. We're gonna begin our presentations today with a focus on organizational policies. Uh, first, Dr. Laura Panette will uh, start us off with introductory remarks about the significance of organizational policies as an upstream determinant of working conditions in the healthcare working environment. And Dr. Panette is one of CPH News founding uh, co-directors, and she is an occupational epidemiologist whose research career at UMass Lowell has focused on healthcare workers. Um, as a primary audience of interest. Uh, Dr. Sunda Sadiq uh, is a CPH New Research Affiliate and her training, she is trained as a physician and holds doctoral and master's degrees in public health from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. She's an occupational epidemiologist who studies psychosocial work exposures uh, in the healthcare, uh, among healthcare workers um, and their impact both on physical and mental health. For the second part of the presentation, we will focus on the impact of public policy as a determinant of the healthcare working environment and health outcomes among healthcare workers. Uh, Dr. Glorian Sorensen will begin with opening remarks on this topic. And Dr. Sorensen is the founding director um, of and current co-director of the Center for uh, Work, Health and Wellbeing at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Um, then Dr. Erica Sabbath, who is an associate professor at, with the School of Social Work at Boston College. And Erica is the co-director of the Center for Work Health Environment with Dr. Sorensen. And Dr. Sabbath is a social and occupational uh, epidemiologist who studies the contribution of the work environment, specifically workplace stressors and organizational and public policy changes to population health and health disparities. And she's focused specifically on healthcare workers and other helping professionals. So with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Panette to start us off. Thank you very much, Suzanne. It's an honor to uh, get us started. Uh, I imagine that many people are aware that the mental health of healthcare workers is a topic of global concern, not least because of job satisfaction and turnover. The rates of leaving the workforce uh, have been increasing steadily among physicians, nurses, nursing aides, and many jobs in between. And this creates excess costs for employers and severe risk for our health as members of the public as quality of care is impacted and even the availability of any care at all. And you just have to read newspaper headlines uh, in some areas of the country to see this happening. Uh, and then further, there's a vicious circle because problems in hiring and retention um, are causing a low ratio of staff to patients and clients um, is itself a well-established risk factor, both for poor patient outcomes and for further job dissatisfaction among healthcare workers. Uh, the Surgeon General has been calling our attention to mental health issues in the workplace, and the CDC has an outreach campaign directed to healthcare workers and institutions, so we, we can see that the urgency of this situation is uh, being noted and attended to uh, through various agencies. Our speakers are going to be pointing to a variety of environmental risk factors for this phenomenon. Uh, as Suzanne said, I'm going to point to um, a few ways that employers can make meaningful changes uh, drawing from the literature just to set a broad context for Dr. Sadiq's comments. Um, safety is a huge issue in this story, although it doesn't, I think, get, always get its due attention. Um, low back injuries are a notorious issue for nurses, aides, orderlies, and other jobs. Other risks range from needle stick injuries to exposure to toxic chemotherapeutic agents. 
Healthcare workers aren't blind to these hazards and they weigh whatever messaging comes from the top against what they observe and experience on the floor. Not infrequently, they decide that they need to prioritize protection of their own long-term well-being and earning capacity. Uh, other issues, organizational issues include work scheduling, work family imbalance, can become an insurmountable stressor, especially for women who unfortunately still bear the biggest share of family household labor and of course are the majority of healthcare workers. Staff participation in work scheduling has been shown to be feasible and should be taken seriously as a strategy for promoting staff well being and retention. Internal communication might not seem like a health and safety issue, but this is in fact an important source of information for people not only about hazards but also what's being done to address them and try to reduce them and uh, communication that treats all employees respectfully in sharing information about challenges and the steps that are being taken to meet them can have a positive impact Whereas messages that we should all try harder, essentially, can rub salt into the wound and can even be perceived as insulting. And then uh, last, although this is uh, somewhat outside the research being presented today by either speaker, I, I really feel I need to flag the issue of um, salary levels because people's compensation is part of what they weigh against their willingness to continue working. And we've, going back 15 or 20 years, we've written about socioeconomic disparities in hazardous exposures in the healthcare sector, the lowest level staff, like nursing aides and mental health workers experience the most overload, the most disrespect and the lowest wages. So rather than um, paying a premium for travel nurses or temporary agency aides, it really would be gratifying to see employers uh, seriously consider the long-term benefits of investing in the employees they already have. All right, that's a very broad context. Uh, I'll turn the stage over to Dr. Sadiq to talk about her more in-depth analyses of some specific organizational conditions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sunda Sadiq. I'm a physician and occupational medicine researcher, and my research has been on safety policies and practices, as well as psychosocial exposures and their impact on mental health in healthcare workers. High job demands and low resources are associated with burnout and many other adverse health outcomes. And the topic of burnout and emotional exhaustion, which is a dimension of burnout uh, and depression and workability are very relevant to healthcare workers, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the existing studies in healthcare workers have focused primarily on licensed clinical staff only. And in the study that I'm going to share with you, we focused on both licensed and unlicensed healthcare workers and with an emphasis on the lower level staff who experience high job strain due to high psychological demands and low job control. So uh, the results I'm going to share with you are from the SHIFT study. SHIFT stands for Safety and Health Through Integrated Facilitated Teams. Uh, so our objective in this study was to examine less studied modifiable work environment stressors, especially physical safety, and assess whether they were associated with a variety of different health health outcomes uh, with an emphasis on organizational safety for support as a resource. Uh, we collected a uh, cross-sectional pre-pandemic sample in 2019, and then we also had another sample, follow-up sample in 2021 during the pandemic. Uh, out of these two samples, about 400 people participated in both baseline and follow-up, so they formed our longitudinal cohort. and. Um, we looked at a variety of different job demands and resources and outcomes. Uh, the outcomes that I focused on were emotional exhaustion, which is the dimension of burnout. And we used the Oldenburg's inventory to measure this. We measured depression using the CSD10 scale, and we also measured workability using the Illumarian uh, workability index. <clears throat> For so job demands, we measured safety hazards, which were general safety hazards. We didn't specifically focus on biological or chemical hazards. We wanted to see how staffing and general safety hazards, access to proper tools and the proper time to perform your duties impacts your workability and mental health. We also used the JCQ questionnaire to measure a number of uh, job demands and resources. We measured 
standards for accepting emotional labor, and for the organizational support for safety, which was a uh, resource of great interest for me, we used the management dimension from the NOZAC variable, NOZAC being the Nordic, Nordic Occupational Health and Safety Climate uh, Tool. So the results I'm going to share with you today are uh, four different papers, two which have already been published, two are under review. The first paper uh, looked at uh, the impact of organizational support for safety and safety hazards on emotional exhaustion, which is the dimension of burnout. Uh, so we wanted to see if high job demands and low resources are associated with the burnout, and if there's a causal association between any fire exposures and the outcome. So what we were able to show was that uh, burnout or emotional exhaustion was higher in female staff and clinical staff and workers between the age of 18 to 40 years. Uh, however, the most important novel finding we had was that the emotional exhaustion scores were lower among those reporting more organizational support for safety. And those workers who had uh, higher job hazards, they reported um, more burnout. So this is the first study to talk about safety hazards and organizational support of safety in this context. Uh, in addition to that, we also did a causal mediation analysis using the van der Waals technique, and our model showed that the association of organizational support for safety in reducing emotional exhaustion was mediated through job level safety hazards, and the similar Simultaneous moderation showed that the organization's support for safety has less benefit on reducing emotional exhaustion when the perception of job hazard was high, suggesting that there was a failure to put policies into practice, and this in itself was a risk hazard. Now, these models demonstrated that there were two interdependent changes that could reduce emotional exhaustion, uh, that is, we would reduce burnout by reduction of perception of job hazards and by improving organizational support for safety. And the different feasible ways for doing that would be to ensure that we have adequate staffing, adequate tools for the healthcare workers to perform their jobs, ensuring that they have proper time to perform their tasks. And most importantly, uh, we should support the staff who call attention to and refuse to work in potentially harmful situations without uh, them fearing for any retribution. Okay, so moving on to my second paper. Uh, now, in this one, I was looking at the same job demands and resources that I shared before, uh, with the difference that I was looking at depression as the outcome. So I wanted to see if there was an imbalance between job demands and resources that would be associated with depression. Uh, and my particular interest was in organizational support for safety and surface acting emotional labor. Now, uh, surface acting emotional labor is a very interesting exposure, and often it's observed in people who work in surface in uh, service industries. And what it means is that if you are a service provider and you are working with a client or a patient who behaves in an unpleasant manner and the service provider has to suppress their actual emotions uh, to maintain a organizationally acceptable facade, and that cognitive dissonance would manifest as surface acting emotional labor. And I wanted to see if it led to depression in our population. Uh, and so I was able to see that uh, this was true. And uh, my results showed that depression was higher in workers aged 18 to 40 years. In the cross-sectional regression, um, surface acting emotional labor, emotional exhaustion, job strain, and work-family conflict were all positively associated with the depression, whereas organizational support for safety was negatively associated. In the longitudinal association, I was able to show how surface acting emotional labor predicted uh, depression and uh, the impact of organizational support for safety was borderline significant, but it was statistically significant. Our model also showed that about 40% of the association between surface acting emotional labor and depression was mediated through emotional exhaustion, which is burnout. So burnout mediated the relationship between surface acting emotional labor and depression. And this kind of ties in the results of my first study where I showed uh, how you could reduce burnout by improving policies and practices. And so here, if you improve them, uh, you would have an improvement of depression as well. So these findings are very not noteworthy because work-family conflict and lack of organizational support for safety in association with depression have not previously been documented, and burnout has primarily been studied with licensed professionals only. So our findings suggested that interventions regarding emotional labor are needed for healthcare workers in order to reduce emotional exhaustion. In addition to that, we also ne need to have organizational level interventions to reduce burnout and consequently to reduce depression. 
so the next study uh, is from the same um, data set. And uh, this third paper looked at, once again, job demands and resources. But in this context, I want to look at workability as my outcome. And we were interested in finding cross-sectional as well as prospective associations between job demands and resources. And what I was able to find out was that workability scores were lower in direct care healthcare workers. Uh, our cross-sectional analysis showed that job demands like job hazards, emotional labor, psychological demands, job strain, assault, and negative acts uh, were all associated with lower workability, whereas resources like organizational support for safety, civility norms, supervisor support, and coworker support were negatively associated associated with workability. In the longitudinal analysis, I was able to show that organization support for safety was the single strongest predictor of workability, and our stratified analysis showed the same results in direct healthcare workers. So these models demonstrated the role of organizational support for safety and the feasible ways to improve staff engagement in safety-related policy construction and the accurate reporting of safety-related incidences, in short, reducing the gaps in policy and practices. And once again, uh, supporting the staff who call attention to these gaps and incorporating their feedback into our policies. So the final paper I'm going to share with you, it ties in the findings of the previous three. So in the first paper, we looked at how organizational support for safety and job hazards, they were associated did with burnout and how you could intervene on them to reduce burnout. In the second paper, I looked at how you could do these interventions to reduce depression. And in the third one, we looked at how safety policies and practices uh, impacted workability and how those interventions will help with that. In this final paper, uh, it sort of shows a practical application of what we discussed so, show, so far. So um, in this study, we were interested in looking at pre-pandemic safety policies and practices, and if they uh, predicted the pandemic work ex experience of healthcare workers. So the reason why we were interested in this, in, in doing an analysis like this was because we did not see any prior studies uh, that have been published that looked at uh, an institutional level response to the pandemic working condition of healthcare workers. And so we wanted to uh, address this gap and we wanted to see if there was an association between pre-pandemic policies and practices with the pandemic work experience. For this purpose, we constructed a mixed method study. So we interviewed 17 healthcare workers from the same healthcare facilities where we collected our quantitative data from. And we interviewed this staff and uh, they were able to identify problems with access to proper PPE, COVID testing, inability to take time off. In addition with that, they found out that the safety policies and practices were often ever-changing and contradictory because of uh, changing CDC guidelines and a lack of existing safety policies to deal with the pandemic. So our longitudinal analysis showed that the odds of having a better work outcome increased with better pre-pandemic OSS and lower job hazard scores. So. For each one of these uh, pandemic safety working uh, safety work uh, outcomes, for instance, intention to leave our their job, supportive safe environment, mental health at work, working with COVID symptoms, or ha having the ability to take sick time off, access to testing, uh, workload during the pandemic, and staffing during the pandemic, each one of these were our pandemic work experience outcomes, and we looked at pre-pandemic organizational support for safety and safety hazard scores. And we wanted to see if the pre-pandemic scores predicted a better outcome. And we were able to show that for each one of these outcomes, uh, the odds of having a better outcome were higher if the pre-pandemic scores were better. So basically, if you have better policies and lower safety hazards before the pandemic, your working experience during the pandemic would be much better. So I think all of these for analysis, they really tied in and emphasize how there is a, a gap in reduction, that we should reduce the gap between policies and practice. And the COVID-19 pandemic unmasked these uh, existing issues uh, and the worsening of healthcare in healthcare workers. Uh, and I think we really were able to show how there needs to be a consistent application of better safety policies to reduce the gap between policy and practice to improve the mental health and workability uh, in healthcare workers. So I would like to take to acknowledge our funding uh, is from NIOSH and uh, CPHNU is my 
uh, parent institution. I would also like to thank uh, our PI, Dr. Laura Panette, the center, our center director, Dr. Susanna Brega, Dr. Becca Gore, as well as my other team members, Serena Rice and Dr. Yuan Zhang, who for their immense contributions to this work. Uh, and uh, we were able to publish two of these studies. The other two are under review. So I would be happy to share them with you. And if you have any questions later on, I would be really happy for that. Um, I would like to share a little bit since I have a little time, of how we measured our safety policies and exposures. So the organizational support for safety, how we measured it, as I mentioned, was from the Nordic Questionnaire for Occupational Health and Safety. Within that, we measured, used um, the management dimension. So basically, we were trying to see if the healthcare work they could contribute meaningfully towards their safety routines, if they would influence those safety policies, if their participation was uh, required, and if those participation was actually useful, and if they reported an event, was it investigated properly? So I think these were already uh, policy-related um, dimensions that we were able to test. And for the safety hazards, instead of looking at specific biological or chemical hazards, we wanted to see if the healthcare workers in general had a safe working environment. And we we're trying to see if there was a gap between safety policies and practice. And uh, then, like I shared earlier, we did surface acting emotional labor, which kind of measured how you, the cognitive dissonance of suppressing true emotions. Uh, I think I am, right on the dot. Thank you, Thank Sunas. You. That's really excellent and a really wonderful presentation in terms of considering the organizational factors uh, around uh, policies that clearly have such an important impact on workers' health, safety, and well-being. Um, thank you both, Laura and Sudas, for positioning our beginning of this conversation around policies with a focus on the organization. We know so clearly from this kind of research that, that the work organization really matters in terms of worker health and safety outcomes, whether we're looking at things like what you just talked about in terms of adequate staffing, having policies in place that are truly put into, into practice and not just on the books, um, really considering whether workers have resources to do their jobs adequately, and then considering not only the safety outcomes, but what that can mean in terms of well-being and uh, workers' resilience overall. I think looking at this in the caregiving profession is really critical. And what we'd like to do now is to turn that um, to look at one other part of the caregiving uh, field. But before I do that, I just would like to kind of switch gears to thinking about public policies. Our center, as we look at um, policies, we really look at the organizational policies as absolutely critical in terms of having that direct impact on worker health and safety outcomes. It's a layered effect at the same time where uh, public policies really can matter, not only in terms of direct, directly influencing worker health, but also influencing the way that organizations themselves may shape some of those policies. So for example, um, on the most basic level, um, federal guidelines around uh, exposures on the job to uh, physical hazards really makes a difference and placing the kinds of limits that OSHA might place on those exposures can be one example of the public policies that really matter. We've certainly seen across the board that other kinds of policies can really make a difference. Certainly during the pandemic, um, which uh, Sudas um, highlighted, the issues around sick leave policies really mattered, and the variability in sick leave policies points to the need for those larger public policies that can really influence worker health. Um, examples might also be wage-related policies. Minimum wage policies, although not necessarily thought of related to health and safety, are clearly having an impact on, on worker health and well-being and are even uh, a critical part of, of election discussions right now. Um, within Massachusetts, uh, some of the recent changes in parental leave policies have the potential of making, um, making things easier for, for uh, fathers and mothers in terms of really thinking about uh, being able to provide care to their families, but also what that means in terms of their own health outcomes and managing work-life balance. 
But so many of those policies, what we think about when we are studying those is sort of how does this affect the positive side of health and well-being? But there can also be negative effects in terms of how some of those policies um, might act. And recently, there's been an increasing discussion about the uh, potential impacts of um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, with the Dobbs decision several years ago in terms of restricting women's access to reproduction, reproductive rights, um, with a focus particularly on abortion, but that's not the only outcome that we need to be considering. Um, these policies clearly have an impact on women's ability to receive the kind of maternal health care that they need. And um, my colleague, Erica Sabbath, has been studying this by looking at uh, OBGYNs around the country, but particularly focusing on some of the states where um, the uh, Dobbs decision has really had the biggest impact. So I think that really considering and really looking at these uh, mental health outcomes not only is a, of concern for the healthcare providers that, that are part of this, but ultimately, certainly for the women who are receiving care. So with that, I will turn it over to Erica. Erica Sabbath, my colleague, is the co-director of our Center for Work, Health, and Wellbeing. And um, an excited, uh, I'm excited to kind of share the, have her share this research with you because I think it's so critical in terms of how we're thinking about some of these issues. So Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Florian. I really appreciate that framing. And today I'm going to be talking about the way that this public policy impact on worker well-being manifests um, specifically in terms of the ways that public policy decisions um, and state abortion bans in the wake of the Dobbs decision has impacted the mental health and work-related well-being of obstetrician gynecologists. Um, this is a project that is an affiliated project of our Center for Work, Health, and Well-Being. It's not one of our core projects. Um, and for this project, I worked with a really incredible team of researchers at UNC Chapel Hill um, and Boston College, where my primary appointment is. Uh, the public policy context here is that, as we all know, about two and a half years ago, uh, Politico leaked a, um, a draft decision in the Dobbs v. Jackson case um, that would essentially pave the way for states to severely restrict abortion or ban it outright. And about two months later, this actually came to pass. Um, and Roe v. Wade, um, the nearly 50-year um, federal protection for abortion um, was overturned. And as an occupational epidemiologist, I immediately thought about, in addition to kind of the broad public health impacts, specifically the occupational health impacts. And as I learned more about these laws, um, my colleague Mara and I realized how very stressful this was going to be for uh, reproductive health care providers, specifically OBGYNs. Um, this is because the ways that the laws were written, they were written in very broad, non-medical language um, in which patients' needs may be in direct conflict with the laws, putting the OBGYN in the position of having to decide between giving a patient the care that they need and their own legal exposure. Um, in addition, there are very few exceptions or they're hard to access. And the real difference here in kind of the the potential impacts on OBGYNs are that the penalties for violating the law fall directly on providers. And they include things like felony conviction, prison sentences, and loss of medical license. So all of this adds up to a potentially huge workplace stress load. And in fact, what has happened in the two plus years since then is that 17 states have functionally banned abortion in nearly all cases. Um, three more cases have more moderate restrictions. And other thing that happened during this period was that the study of OBGYNs in post-Roe America or SOPRA was funded by the Green Wall Foundation. Um, and the aims of this study are twofold. Um, they're first to understand the ways that these laws have impacted personal and professional well-being among OBGYNs. And then thinking about the interplay of organizational and public policy to think about how organizations in abortion restrictive states can change their policies to better support their OBGYN. 
Um, and today I'm going to be talking about a dimension of this research where we're going to look at the ways that OBGYNs perceive that the laws have impacted their own health and well-being. Um, this was a qualitative study um, of U.S. board-certified OBGYNs. Um, you were eligible if you practiced in one of the 14 states where abortion was illegal at the time that we began data collection. Um, the policy landscape has shifted over the past um, two years or so. Um, we recruited participants via social media, listservs, direct contact, snowball sampling, really trying to get a broad ideological in addition to demographic um, cross-section of the OBGYN workforce. Um, we conducted semi-structured interviews via Zoom and we coded them with a thematic qualitative approach. And specifically for this presentation, we had a question about whether people felt that the laws had impacted their health and well-being. Uh, we were able to get participants from every state that had an abortion ban with the exception of Mississippi, so representing 13 of the 14 eligible states. Um, the, we had the most participants from Idaho. And our sample broadly mirrors the OBGYN workforce in the U.S. It is a little bit more female and a little bit more white than the OBGYN workforce as a whole. Um, and this represents about 50-50 academic versus community hospital physicians, which is sort of important in terms of like the level of um, both patient acuity and also um, legal protection that people got from their employer. So we um, coded our, our health code. We, at, in our analysis, we figured that we kind of coded for six broad domains of health impact. Um, the first, which we had really hypothesized, was mental health. And when we looked at the number of participants who reported symptoms of anxiety and depression, we found that 70% of them um, reported anxiety and depression symptoms as a direct consequence of their state's abortion policy. An example of someone who reported anxiety was this person who said, I have a family. I worried about a, a bad legal outcome. I worry about losing my license. I worry about losing my livelihood. I worry about my stress and my burden being something that I carry home and affecting my partner. It bleeds into everything. And another person, when talking about kind of the overall impact on their mental health, was one of many people who began crying um, during the um, interview. And she said, this whole situation has been really hard on my mental health, and I'm going to tear up while we're doing this interview. Think of the level of stress and anxiety that we live in. It's not sustainable, and I don't think I'm being safe. The next um, broad area of impact we, we identified was burden of negative emotions. Um, and I'm going to highlight two of those emotions here. Um, the first was hopelessness. And one person said, I was talking to one of the other obstetricians who was trying to encourage me to be hopeful. And I just started crying, standing in the middle of the nurse's station, crying into a paper towel. And several people brought up anger. And this person said, my number one emotion that keeps me up is anger. I'm just so angry. I'm angry at the ignorance. I'm angry that it's so misogynistic. I don't like being an angry person. I am not by nature an angry person. Um, the next area of impact we found was burnout. Um, and as soon just talked about, one major dimension of burnout is emotional exhaustion. And um, this person said, I find myself more and more not worrying about the care I've given, but worrying about the perception of the care I've given. There is just a lot of scrutiny and criticism, and it is mentally exhausting. The fourth area of impact that we identified was in terms of health behaviors. Um, and remembering that this is a population of physicians who, as a group, tend to have very positive health behaviors. This group actually tends to take a more individual approach to health than what we do in public health, and health behaviors are like, quite important. Um, and this person said, I used to be really vigilant about making sure I exercise a certain amount of time. Now there's just been a lot of junk, crappy food that I never thought I would do in my adult life. So physically it's taken a toll, just knowing that you're not taking the best care of yourself. Um, and this next person sort of, I think encapsulates the total worker health approach quite nicely. Um, and she said, I try to get my exercise and my meditation. I try to eat healthy. 
I try to come home and not have a drink. I try to do all the self-care things, but there's only so much self-care you can do and it doesn't change the fundamental situation. So the, the next area that we um, identified as an area of health impact was sleep. And we actually asked a question, um, what keeps you up at night? And we thought that people were going to talk about kind of their broad worries about their state policy environment, but actually in this context, several people talked about how the law directly contributed to their difficulty sleeping. Um, the context before this next quote is that um, a participant was describing um, how a patient's um, intrauterine device failed um, and she needed a hysterectomy um, after she had a life-threatening pregnancy complication. And during this time, the treatment was delayed because of the law. Um, because of the way that this person's hospital interpreted the law, the participant was not sick enough to have um, medical intervention. Um, and this was kind of a the participant was just talking about how upsetting this outcome was. And she said, I had difficulty sleeping for the next several weeks because I was so upset for her that she had done everything right. And when her contraception had failed her, we then also failed her and she had a horrible outcome. Um, and the last area of impact that we identified was personal relationships. And this was alluded to a little bit in one of the earlier quotes um, but one person said, even when I'm home with my husband and my children, I'm not connecting with them anymore in the way that I used to because this worry is so dominant in my mind. And people talked a lot about how preoccupied they were with the possibility of um, being having criminal charges brought against them. So in terms of kind of where this fits into the discussion of healthcare worker mental health and determinants. Um, as Florian said, physician mental health is a long-standing occupational health concern. And during COVID, this really came to light, but it actually has been an issue for a very long time. And what we find in this study is that jobs-related stressors have further contributed to the burden of poor mental health and work-related well-being among OBGYN, kind of above and beyond pandemic. Um, the other contribution here is that we've identified impacts beyond mental health and well-being, extending into physical health as well. And in terms of public health implications, for this group of physicians specifically, um, in other work, we discuss um, the impact on people's desire to stay in their state and continue practicing. Um, and in our sample, about six people out of 54 had left their state, and another 60% were considering leaving. And these are already states that have among the highest levels of maternal mortality. And so if these physicians leave their states um, because of these negative health impacts, it could have a disproportionate negative impact on availability um, and proximity of pregnancy care. Um, when we started this project, I, our kind of guiding framework was that we were not so naive to think that our findings were going to change public policy. I think the discourse around these laws has made it really clear that evidence doesn't matter much um, and that results from a scientific study were not going to change um, the way that public policy is made. But what hospitals do have control over is the organizational environment and organizational policies and practices that they can enact that can either amplify the harms um, that are brought about by these laws um, or they can help buffer the impacts of the laws on OBGYNs. Um, so on the second anniversary of Dobbs, um, JAMA published six recommendations that came from our team for how organizations can enact policies to um, protect and promote the well-being of their physicians. Um, I want to acknowledge the Greenwall Foundation, um, which has funded this work. Um, and again, that SOPRA is an affiliated project of the Harvard Center for Work, Health, and Well-Being. And my last acknowledgement is for um, these 54 physicians who took the time and um, trusted us um, to share their experience and getting to share what these last years have been like for them has really been the greatest honor of my professional life. Thank you so very much for that presentation.
Thank you so much to our excellent uh, speakers and our panelists today. And thank you for joining us for the TRANS webinar.